Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Erica. And I'm Stephen. And we're from Brooklyn Brew Shop, and we're so glad that you're here to learn how to make beer. Uh, we're, yeah, we're making up a batch today, and yeah, let's take it away. Yeah, so we're going to be brewing our New England IPA. If you have any questions at all, anytime during class, use that chat box, and we'll get to it during or at the end when we do a Q&A. Yeah, we have our little command center here, so if you have questions, we'll see them. We'll answer them either out loud or maybe we'll chat something. Um, but yeah, we're going to make sure that from pretty much getting your kit to the first big brew day, you're covered. Awesome. So I have two quarts of water heating up right now to 160 degrees, which is when we're going to mash in. First question for, for the audience, do you need this in metric as well? All the instructions have both a U.S. measurement and metric, but I can definitely tell you what it is in Celsius if, if you need it. So let us know in the chat. Cool. So, yeah, as I said, we're making New England IPA. And the first step, um, pretty much before you even get started brewing, is yeah. making some sanitizer. Yes. <laughs> so, so you're going to make a bit of sanitizer. We actually already blended some uh, for ourselves today. But when you're making sanitizer, it's going to be half a packet of sanitizer with a gallon of water. Um, and then you're just going to fill a bowl and... A good trick is to mix it up right in your jug. So just put in half the packet, add water to the one gallon mark, shake it up, and then transfer it into a bowl. And we love to have a spray bottle so that anything... We also love giving <laughs> proper warning when we're testing and displaying the spray bottle. <laughs> um, so anything you need to sanitize laser later on, you can just give a spray or dunk in the water. Awesome. Exactly. So let's, before we dive into the mash, uh, just kind of go over what's in your kit and what you're looking at. So your one gallon fermentation jug. This is your airlock. You don't actually need this on brew day. You need it three days later. So we can uh, leave it on for a decoration for now, but you're not gonna use it today your screw cap stopper, sanitizer, which we already went over, your tubing, racking cane and tip, and tubing clamp. Don't need it all on brew day. These are all for bottling, so you can just set these aside for two weeks. Your thermometer, mine's already in the pot and we are this just went a little low, so I'm turning the heat back on. Yeah, so we're just heating this up right now to like 156 degrees. Yeah. And then we have our grain. So it's uh, three or four types of malted barley in there, uh, depending on what beer you're brewing. And for the New England IPA, it actually has a little bit of wheat as well, which adds that nice, like, hazy, creamy mouthfeel that you really love in, in hazy IPAs. So we're going to cut this open. Cool. And we got some great questions on the mash and the sparge, and we'll be answering them as we go. So thanks for sending those in. Awesome. Two. Oh, and I'm going to get a little close up. One second. All right. You can go ahead and start pouring in. So, hope you're all seeing that, and that's not looking all right. So for the mash, we're basically making a big pot of oatmeal. So, it's looking good, and we'll start to give that a quick stir. Cool. That was our first experiment in live switching, so I hope it worked out uh, all right for you. So the mash lasts an hour, and you're really, your only job is to keep it at temperature. So we're keeping it between 144, 152 degrees. Um, it was warmer than that, but as soon as you add the grain, that drops the temperature down, and grain holds its temperature really well. So I actually like to just shut off the heat, 
let it get in and then monitor it. Check it every 10, 15 minutes. If it gets a little bit too low, turn the heat back on low, stir. If it gets too hot, you want to move it off the burner and you can add a little bit of cold water to bring that temperature down. Yeah, and uh, we got a question from Robert who asked basically that, how do you keep your temperature consistent uh, during the mash? And kind of like Erica said, um, a little goes a very long way. So keep your temperature super, super low and really you can most likely leave it there. Um, once you get it right to your temperature, take it off if it's too hot, put it back on if it needs to be warmed back up again. And this is when um, a heavy bottom pot it comes in handy because it holds temperature well. If you're using like a really thin aluminum pot, you just have to monitor it a little bit more closely. Check it every five minutes because those can get really hot and really cold quickly. Same if you're using an electric stove, they heat up and all of a sudden it's, it's kind of boiling in the pot, which you don't want. So um, you know your stove, you know your pots and just check it more or less depending. Yeah, and the more you brew, the more comfortable you'll feel, not just with how the process works from a, like a theory level, but you'll actually learn how your pots and how your equipment handles what you need it to do. So the rule of thumb here is kind of like, think Goldilocks. Uh, everything is like right in the middle. So you don't want it, you don't want to let your temperature get too cold because if it gets too cold, you're not necessarily going to convert all those starches into fermentable sugars. And if it gets too hot, you're gonna caramelize your beer um, so that basically it'll be a little on the sweet side, but you're not going to be able to get sugars that can then ferment into alcohol. So keep it right where you, where you want it to. And remember, read your instructions thoroughly. All the beers are a little different. So we're doing the New England IPA today, um, just a reminder. And so you want to keep it right as close to 152 Fahrenheit as possible. Awesome. And yeah, so that um, kind of just to recap what the mash is, you're steeping the grain in hot water. And what that is doing is making sure that you're going to get all the color and flavor and most importantly, fermentable sugars when we go into the next step. So this is an hour, nothing to stress about. Just check on it, make sure it's still in the range give it a little stir, make sure nothing's sticking to the bottom. But otherwise, it's, it's pretty inactive this hour. And we got a question from Max about just the grain content. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically I um, alluded to it briefly, but all beer is for the most part made of malted barley. So if anyone's ever done that science experiment when you were a kid and you took a bean and you put it in like a damp paper towel and then watched it sprout and then you planted it, so imagine doing that, but instead of planting this lovely bean, you instead put it in the oven and you then made Get beer it. with that bean. <laughs> yeah, you killed the bean. But. So that's, that's basically what malting is. And we do that so that we have nice starches and proteins ready to become beer. And um, most mixes have a few different types of malted barleys in there. The biggest one offhand is called base malt. It's like a, basically a family of grains. Um, the names of base malts are going to be pretty closely related to the names of beers you might recognize. So you'll have pale ale, that's a base malt. You'll have pilsner, that's another base malt that's going to be common in German and Belgian style beers. Uh, you're going to have uh, Maris Otter, which is like a little sweeter uh, pale ale, and American Two Row, which is like really common in most IPAs. Uh, then you're going to have caramel malts or crystal malts. Uh, those are kind of have the same name. Um, you might see grain called C10 or C20 or C60. All the way up to C120. And that's just how long it's been roasted. And so if you're at the lower end, you're getting like a little bit of sweetness, um, but still a lot of fermentable sugars. And the higher up you go, the more caramelized flavor you get, um, like caramel around C60 and toffee around 120. Uh, but with that, the trade-off is, is that that's no longer a fermentable sugar. It's just kind of adding flavor and color to your beer. Exactly. And then you'll have some toasted malts like Biscuit or Victory, which can actually make your beer taste kind of like crackers and warm bread. So if you're looking for that like kind of warm, uh, like nice malty beer character, you might find it there. And then you also have 
roasted malt, so black malt, chocolate malt, roasted barley. Um, with those, a little bit goes a very long way. So like for this mash here, you're talking about basically like a couple spoonfuls, realistically, and that's gonna give your beer kind of smoky tobacco, like chocolate. dark chocolate, yeah. Um, and it's gonna give it a lot of color really quickly. So even most stouts are mostly base malt. So when you actually see the grain bill in a stout, you'll be surprised, except for, for Guinness and a few other examples, you'll be surprised at how much light colored grain is actually going into a stout. Yeah. And while I, I said the mash lasts an hour, you don't have to sit and watch me stir for that. So I actually have one ready to go so that we can move on to the next step. Does anyone have any more questions about the mash before we sparge? Um, yeah, we have a question from Jamie that basically is just concerned about, you know, if it does go too hot, as long as it's just for a little bit of time. Yeah, and, and that's the okay? thing, um, can't stress enough, is you can be a couple minutes behind, a couple degrees off, and still have delicious beer. If you're making the Everyday IPA and it's coming in a little bit lower in ABV, that's okay. You're, that's still going to be delicious. Um, don't worry about it. It's nothing that like, oh, it got too hot. I should toss it. Never toss it. Um, email us first. It's very rare that you've actually messed up your beer that much. Um, but it, yeah, so don't, don't worry. Uh, and just try and correct it. So moving it off a burner, adding cold water, you're going to be adding a lot more water in the sparge. Um, and if it gets too hot, you're losing water. So don't be afraid to add some cold tap water to bring it back down to temperature. That's totally fine. Yeah, and then another question about if we have a digital thermometer recommendation. We don't sell this, but one that we actually really like using is called the Chef Alarm. Um, you can look it up on the internet. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's nice. We use it also for our turkey. So, yeah, <laughs> so and, and it's, it's great for cheese making um, Yeah, as we well. primarily used it for cheese making, like making cheddar, um, where you can kind of dial it in between a couple degrees, and it has a, an obscenely lo a loud alarm if you want it to, um, whether you're going too hot or too cold. And again, that's called the Chef Alarm. Um, and then uh, one more question about um, like brew in a bag, uh, also like working in a cooler. Um, these are alternate setups that a lot of people do like. Um, we do tend to recommend, and just our preference is on a pot. We like when it feels more like cooking. Uh, it's easier to kind of get an, an attachment to the process when you're using stuff that you already have in your kitchen. Um, brew in a bag is fine, and if, for anyone that doesn't know what that is, it's um, basically a nylon sack that you line your um, pot with, and you do the grain and the mash and everything in there, and then you lift it up and you're done with it. You can do that, but when you do that, you're going to get lower efficiency um, because you're not doing a proper sparge, which is the next step. Yeah, so you're, you're gonna lose alcohol. Um, if you're using, you can certainly sparge with a nylon sack, Absolutely. Um, if you want to have it in your pot during the mash, fine. Um, but we definitely recommend doing the full sparge so you're getting all that color and, and flavor and most importantly the fermentable sugars so that you're getting the full ABV of the beer. Otherwise, if you're just soaking the grain in the total amount of water, um, you're not, and not kind of cycling it through, you're not getting all those sugars. Yeah. And um, I think last question before we move on to the last step is just shelf life for the kits. And if anyone of you hear sirens, um, we are filming in our kitchen in Brooklyn. And uh, that way is a police station, and that way is a fire station, and that way is the uh, Manhattan Bridge. Uh, so we are definitely in the city, uh, so excuse the sirens. Um, but just shelf life was the question. Uh, if anyone's curious about like how good their... Um, their kit is on the back of your yeast packet is a date. Um, so I think check that. <laughs> yeah, check the date when you get your kit. Um, I think currently um, your the ones we're shipping out either have a March 2020 or a July 2021 date. Um, so that's that's you know fresh. It's it's well in the future. The hops in here are vacuum sealed, uh, which is like the best way to store hops by far and the grain is in a really thick plastic so they stay fresh for for quite a bit um but use your yeast as your as your freshness gauge yeah and if you if you have the kit just kind of in a closet for a couple of years um and need fresh yeast shoot us an email it's on our accessories page you can get a replacement and get brewing so we're going to fast forward 
The mash has uh, been going for 60 minutes. It's great. And now we're going to mash out, which is just heating this up to 170 degrees. And stirring. So yeah, the mash out is important because the 170 degrees is basically your rule of thumb for the next few minutes. You want your grain to be at 170 and you want your water to be at 170. And your goal is basically keep those both at 170 until you have finished. There's a lot of jargon words, so this is going to be your, I think your first jargon word. It's called wort, W-O-R-T, uh, pronounced wort. Um, but it's basically pre-beer, so it's the liquid that will become your beer. And Steven said heating up water. What he's referring to is behind us here, we have four quarts of water heating up to 170 degrees, and that's going to be our sparge water. If you're only working with one pot, um, if you have two, it's great to get it started ahead of time. If you only have one, you'll want to transfer this into a bowl and then start heating up your water in the same pot. You can totally get away with it, but it's definitely handy to have two. So this is good to go. Cool. And we put the sparge word down below so you can get a little uh, vocabulary lesson as we go. That's what we're about to start right now. Okay. What do you mean? I'm going to just rinse this out. Cool. So we'll be doing a little bit of rinsing. rinsing. Um, there's, we have a lot of swap outs kind of ready because the actual brew day when you're doing it at home is going to be close to like three hours or so, but we're going to try to condense it all into a uh, half hour, 45 minutes for you today. So Eric is just um, prepping a pot over there. Um, so the sparge is one of those weird words that actually translates um, to sprinkle, uh, even though it sounds a whole lot scarier. Uh, than, um, but basically your goal is to get out all the sugars that you've developed from your mash because uh, remember, you're turning starches into sugar. Now you want to get that all out of the grain because while it was fine as a nice little pot of oatmeal, it'll be better as beer. Yeah. So. So clean pot and a strainer. The strainer is amazing because it holds all of your grain. Once again, know your own kitchen equipment if you're have a smaller strainer, you might be doing this in two batches. Totally fine. Uh, just don't pour more than, than your strainer can hold. Cool. And um, yeah, we have, we have questions. We'll get to them. But now we'll, we'll spark. Yeah. Sorry. So first, you're just pouring in the grain and all the liquid. There you go. Well, last bit of grain in. Got the cut just in time for you people at home. <laughs> <laughs> but here you go. It's a real nice, um, real nice view of what you're, what you're talking about right now. Yeah. So. And so, and now I'm going to pour over the additional sparge water. And this is kind of just like a big thing, a pour over coffee. You want to do it, oh, you know, get it all over slowly, evenly. And this step makes you realize why barley is wonderful. And barley is so popular in beer making because it has a tough outer husk that makes the sparge possible. So when you're pouring through, it's actually going through. If you're having making a beer with a lot of wheat or a lot of rye, this can get a little bit gummed up. Um, also, we've done like gluten-free beers with carrots and beets and, and vegetables. Vegetables can also get gummed up too. So there we go. Everything in. And one of the questions we get is uh, about that first liquid with that you mashed with, whether you save that, absolutely. All the liquid you, goes into the sparge and will be part of your boil. So this is your first, first, first cycle through. <laughs> first running. 
Yeah. So now we're going to move the strainer back to the first pot that we started with. And we're going to then take this and pour it straight through. Uh, yeah, do you the can honors? do it. Okay. <laughs> and again, we're just going to pour through very slowly. And it's okay if at the beginning you pour a little quickly because remember you're dealing with hot liquid and while slowness and, um, you know, is of a primary concerns because you're going to get more sugar out of it. Number one, a rule is to be safe and to not spill because you have to be a good roommate and you also have to not burn yourself. Um, so it's hot. It's not scalding, but, you know, just be careful. And you're just pouring it through slowly and evenly. And Erica said before, it's like pour over coffee. So if anyone else is a coffee nerd, and I know there are a lot of you because we make beer. <laughs> and um, we went to Perennial, um, which is a great brewery, and we were talking to, it's down in St. Louis, and the brewer there was basically just saying how he got really, really into beer, obviously, and then he was like, what's another way to spend a whole lot of time and in getting really into a subject? So he went into coffee, uh, which kind of we do too. We have a lot of coffee stuff too. So just pouring this. And, and we also make cheese and fermented vegetables. If you're interested in other food ferments, um, definitely check out our YouTube Farm Steady channel. We come out with new recipes every and new videos every week uh, for things like kraut, pickles, fermented hot sauce. Um, so if you want to expand your fermentation beyond beer, uh, we're, we're happy to show you how. Yeah, we just put up a video for pineapple, turmeric, mint, kraut. Um, and like, even if you're like kraut skeptical, because, you know, how many times have you been to a beer garden and you've gotten that big plate of kraut next to your sausage and like, it's good, but you're not like going home and eating it necessarily by on its own, but you can do some really cool stuff with kraut that, um, yeah. So if you're into making weird and fun beers, it might turn... Uh, might, you might be interested, and that's just at Farmsteady. So this goes through a little slowly. Um, it's going to go through... You know, be yeah. careful. It'll go, it'll go. No, don't need yeah. to rush it. Um, just, yeah, take your time. Uh, the thing to remember is this is a New England IPA, and New England IPAs have a fair amount of wheat. Um, and you might be thinking, like, that's odd. Like, I don't really think of there being wheat in an IPA. But... What's different about a New England IPA, as you know at home, is that it's super, super cloudy and it's super, super aromatic and hoppy. So wheat is cloudy. Wheat makes things cloudy. There's going to be a lot more things in suspension. Because of that, it also slows down the sparge. And there's actually a fair amount of wheat in here. Um, it's not quite half, but it's, it's a substantial amount. Um, so that will slow your sparge. So it's nothing to worry about if it's going through slowly. Just take your time. Um, and also what that means later on is that when all those hops are bubbling on your nose, it's because the wheat is in there kind of helping it all stay yeah. floating. Holding it up. It's like little little floaties in, in your beer. Exactly. Any so, more questions? Yeah, we got a few questions. So again, we're just going to let this drip and... Um, yeah, so the thing with this is you can actually taste the grain as you go, um, and it'll get less sweet as you, um, as you do it. Yeah, and you can, you know, help it move along, but do it slowly, gently, uh, you don't have to force it through, don't splatter it all over the table like I did a second ago. This is great. Cool. So we have some questions. How large is the strainer that we sell on the website? This is it. This is the strainer. This is the pot that we sell on the website. This is what we use. We only sell what we what we use every day. So it's kind of perfect. You do want a large strainer. You might not have a strainer that large at home. If that is the case, you can break it into two batches. It's not the end of the world. Um, there's a lot of... Um, you know, you can you can work around a lot of tricks um, to to make a successful batch of beer. The important thing to remember is that people have been making beer for thousands of Forever. years, and <laughs> they didn't have this, they didn't have this, they didn't have that, they didn't have this. 
they didn't have sirens uh, a thousand <laughs> years ago, but they made successful beer, um, so it's nothing to worry about. And to just recap the process, if anybody jumped in late, the first step was the mar the, the mash, yes, uh, where we just heated the grain in hot water for an hour. Then the sparge, where we took that grain, poured additional hot water over it, and collected all the liquid. This liquid is now called wort, and it's going to be our future beer. And it has all that color, flavor, and fermentable sugars from the grain. The grain is now spent grain. Um, you don't need it anymore for your brew day, but if you, if you feel bad throwing away pretty substantial amount of grain, uh, we have recipes on our website, on the mash, um, for dehydrating this, making pizza dough, making cookies. Um, you can do a lot of really great recipes with it. It's also excellent for compost. Um, it is a brown, so when you're doing compost, fresh vegetable scraps are greens and like dead leaves are browns and you layer them. And so this is a brown year round that you can use, which is great. Um, and it, if you were your brewery, we would be carting it off to like a pig or a chicken farm. So if you live someplace with chickens and pigs, they love to eat it as well. Yeah, and I'm just tossing up a real um, quick shot of that. Yeah, so spent grain chef, um, but tons of recipes. One of the ones at the top is the spent grain granola. Um, I love it. It's 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 like a it's a free ingredient because you're or like a two for one ingredient because you're getting beer and then you can use it to make other delicious things. And all you're really doing is stripping out all the sugars from the grain, so it's actually like a healthier grain to begin with. Uh, so this, do you want to get a close up of what's in the pot now? Absolutely. Oh, and then there was another question about the pumpkin beer. Um, we have a pumpkin beer where we actually do some pumpkin in the mash. Yeah. Traditionally, that was actually how you made pumpkin beer. Um, pumpkin beers didn't used to always taste like um, pumpkin spice latte. Uh, there was mainly because pilgrims did not have enough grain to yeah. make beer. So, yeah, that's going to be the same deal where it'll be a little slower. Yeah, so when grain stores were low, uh, people didn't want to give up bread and they didn't want to give up alcohol, so they'd substitute uh, with some root vegetables to get sugars and convert those. Yeah. So. But okay, so this is your spent grain. That was a close up of that. Yep. And then here is your wart. That W O R T. W O R T. <laughs> uh, pretty gross sounding word, but uh, it's going to be future beer, so we'll like it. Um, you can you can spark, run this through a third time. Um, it's up to you. A good test is you taste the grain before, and then you taste it after you've run it through twice. And if it's still sweet, then run it through again. There's still more fermentable sugars, more stuff you want to get out of that grain. Three times is great. Um, we don't tend to do like five, six times because you start pulling in tannins and things that you don't want in your final beer. So as long as the grain tastes pretty much like neutral, cardboardy, not super sweet, then it is spent and you're done with it. Exactly. Cool. So, step one, the mash. Step two, the sparge. We're done. And step three, uh, one of those super jargony words, the boil. I mean, not jargony at all. So the boil is exactly what it sounds like. You bring this to a boil. And for most recipes, that's when you start adding the hops. New England IPAs are special, and we actually add the hops before we even bring it to a boil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a fun word called first wort. So what this is doing is basically um, adding hops before you actually heat up your beer. So that's a popular question is like, when do I actually start the timer? When do I add the first set of hops? Typically, it won't be right now, but just keep in mind, this time, it is. So remember, read your instructions very carefully before you start uh, brewing. And we're actually going to add some of our hops yeah. right here. And the New England IPA uses two of my favorite hops ever, Cascade, which um super popular in most American IPAs, like orangey pine, um, and mosaic hops, which are less common, but delicious. They have uh, berry flavors, which um, is, is pretty uncommon in hops, um, but it's... You, 
it's a really great combination and it smells so good. So we're gonna just put these guys in. Well, I can get rid of this. Yeah, and we'll bring this to a boil. And the boil, even if you add the hops early, does not start until, the timer doesn't start until it's actually boiling. So. We've been heating this up a little bit to speed this whole um, day along, um, but you're gonna put it on um, high heat. So as high as your burner can go at this point until you get to that boil. And um, let's see, is there five to six liters of wort? Um, so we got a question, is this five to six liters of wort? Um, essentially, yeah, because uh, we're making a gallon, which is just shy of four liters. Um, at this point, before you go into the boil, you want roughly 20% more wort than your finished beer. Because just like if you were making a soup or a stock or a sauce, you're going to be reducing that liquid. Um, this is when making a beer really does feel like cooking because you're just boiling something on your stove and you're going to notice that is the water level is going down and that makes total sense because you're you're just firing up a stove. And once it gets to a boil, you want to reduce it so that it's not like bubble, 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 but kind of like the lowest temperature that it still keeps at a boil to avoid too much evaporating off. If too much does, and when you pour it in here, it's like here and you want it up here, tap it with cold water, you just reduced it um, and shoot for a lower boil next time. Cool, and um, we got a question, if someone wants to get a kit that we don't ever on have on our site anymore, what should they do? Um, you can always send us an email at info at brooklynbrewshop.com and we'll either direct you to a store that might have it near you or we might be able to yeah. make it or maybe we should come Maybe, 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 it should come, maybe it should come back. Yeah. So, Wh um, which flavor are you missing? <laughs> uh, and also, we can tell you how to do variations on the recipes that are up on the site right now. We have always uh, like experimenting. It's your beer once, once you're making it in your kitchen. So if you're looking to add fruit or looking to add spices and wondering where you put them in, we're happy to, to tell you exactly. Um, but a general rule of thumb is kind of like, this is like a soup. Anything you put in in the beginning, that's going to be your background flavors. They're gonna hang up and meld. So if you're, if you're doing, you want hearty things in there. Um, that's when you normally add your bittering hops and that kind of, you're not getting a lot of the aroma and flavor, but you're getting that like deep bitterness. Um, so spices, hearty spices like cinnamon, you can add in earlier in the boil. Things that are fresh, like fresh herbs, flowers, fruit, you want to add at the very end. And that's because the less time it spends in the heat, the more aroma and like top flavors you're going to get. And the more time is like melding into the background and creating a delicious. And that definitely includes citrus. Because one question we have is someone brewing the grapefruit honey ale and they want to know if they can switch it out with tangerine. So they're making a tangerine honey ale. And absolutely. absolutely with that, you're still going to be adding it at the very end because you want to get that citrus aroma. Um, and then thank you to Brian, who recommends that if anyone's looking to make some of our old beers, we do have two books. Oh, yes. We always forget to say that. <laughs> we wrote two books. You should check them out. One's Brooklyn Brew Shop's Beer Making Book, and the other one is Make Some Beer, Small Batch Recipes from Brooklyn to Bamberg, where we basically traveled the globe uh, coming up with beers inspired by some of our favorite craft breweries. Not sure where you are, but I'm sure one of them was pretty close to you. So <laughs> And uh, a handful of recipes straight from the brewery. So Evil Twin contributed a recipe. Um, some really, really great beers in there to make. Yeah. And then um, one person just wanted a clarification on the volumes uh, of water. So again, for the mash, we heated up uh, two quarts. Yep. And that depends on the recipe. Uh, so if you're making... A higher ABV beer uh, that has a lot more grain, it might be two and a half, two and a quarter um, quarts. This recipe, your instructions will tell you, uh, was two quarts. So we heated that for the mash and then we heated an additional four quarts during the sparge. So one and a half gallons of water have so far gone into this beer. Two quarts 
four quarts. Uh, so, <laughs> that's not too math live. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's people in Europe saying, what is a quart? Yes. Long story. But it's essentially a quart is a liter. It's pretty um, close in approximation. Yeah, yeah. So two quarts is 1.9 liters. Four quarts is 3.8 liters. Um, and just to run through those temperatures, Mashin was 160 degrees Fahrenheit, 71 degrees Celsius, kept it in a range of 144 to 152 degrees Fahrenheit, or 63 to 68 degrees Celsius, mashed out at 170 or 77. Um, and now the boil, you don't even need a temperature, so I get to stop doing Celsius, which is great. <laughs> and the question uh, we got was, do you add bittering hops first? Yes, um, so this is a little different because New England IPA isn't super bitter to begin with, but typically, yes, you add hops for bittering toward the beginning. So let's say if, if you brewed our everyday IPA that has Cascade hops and Columbus hops, you add the Columbus at the very beginning and then you add the Cascade uh, as you approach the end because that's your aroma. So some usually it's a little more clearly defined. Here you're adding two, like, super aromatic hops that you will happen to be using also for bitterness in the beginning. Yeah, and a lot of them. So I already added in a bunch, but you can see uh, I have a whole lot more. The fun part of the New England IPA is that only actually two of these cups go in on brew day. The rest you save, you can store it in the fridge um, for to add directly to the fermenter, and that's how you're getting all the hop flavor an aroma and like none of it's boiling off because it literally just went in cold days later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, another question about the citrus, um, do you add the peel or the juice? Um, we, for the longest time, just do the peel, which gives you a really nice citrus aroma. It kind of complements citrusy hops, but increasingly what you see are these like citrus IPAs where they're just like super, super juicy. Um, we actually have one out. It's a collaboration with BrewDog. It's their Elvis juice, which if you want to brew one, it's really, really good, super like spiky and citrusy. And with that, we actually take uh, grapefruit and just squeeze it over the beer and just drop it in. Um, it's, it's, um, it's pretty great to just have the half of the, like the half of the citrus in there. You're going to get a super, super citrusy beer, but it's a little bit different than what like the grapefruit honey is, um, out of the box, but by all means, you can do it. Cool. So, we have a boil. Yeah. Ready? So, we're going to do a quick swap out. We have a boil underway. So, you can turn that back on, and we'll get a nice tight shot of that. The boil. Okay, cool. So what you're seeing here is the boil. This is, a, this is a quite vigorous. So we can probably turn it down a little bit because this just started boiling. So we're going to turn it down a little bit because we want a nice like rolling boil. Um, yeah, so it's still bubbling. And so you see like here you got foam, there you got foam. Um, when the boil first starts, the whole thing is like basically all nice and foamy. What you see here, that's called the hot break. So that is when you actually start your timer. When you notice the bubbles piercing through that foam, that's when you should set your timer. Typically, it's gonna be a 60 minute timer. Um, all of them are gonna be a little bit different. Um, we say a 60 minute timer because most, most of the beers that we sell uh, and make, have 60 minute boils. A 90 minute boil is something you can do, but that's gonna be a lot thicker. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever drank Dogfish Head 60 minute IPA, 90 minute IPA, and 120 minute IPA, the simple difference is that one is boiled for 60 minutes, one is boiled for 90 minutes, and the other is boiled for two whole hours. And that's why one is a normal drinkable IPA, one is a pretty big double IPA, and one is a really, really big. IPA that's just like thick and syrupy because syrupy, yeah. they just boil down a whole lot more. Uh, and, and the Warrior IPA on our site is a 75 minute boil. So if you want to experiment with longer boils and more imperial style beers, that's a great place to start. Absolutely. So nobody needs to watch a pot boil for an hour. 
um, including you while you're brewing. Uh, set your timers for when you need to add in the hops and then just don't worry about it. Put it in. It's, we always say that brew days are great laundry days because you know you can you're gonna be home, you're gonna be doing stuff. Uh, so yeah, get and, uh, more things done than just the beer. And we have a question: just how much total hops are in here? I, I'm fairly certain, and I can double check this after. But uh, for the New England IPA, it's a whole ounce of hops, yeah. so it's like a half ounce of Cascade and a half ounce of Mosaic. And then we have a question about cinnamon. Because if you were adding cinnamon to your beer, it would be during the boil, and you're going to be adding that kind of yeah. in the middle. You could do it. You could do it 20 minutes in, so it's in for 40 minutes. You could do it a half hour. Cinnamon, you're going to get a lot of flavor from. It's really delicious. Uh, but and it can, if it's a cinnamon stick, can hang out totally. And we have a question: just where we source our ingredients from. Um, so we use the same suppliers that your local craft brewery uses. Um, for the most part, uh, hops, we, um, you know, we get, we get them from Washington state, Oregon. That's where like 85% of hops are grown. Uh, the mosaic, I, uh, actually is from New Zealand. Um, they just, hops are one of the one place in beer, probably the, the biggest place where terroir, like what you'd normally think of in wine really comes into effect and climate. And in addition to whole lots of, um, selective breeding over the course of decades um, really makes a tremendously different flavor hop from one region to the other to one varietal to the other. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I think. Ooh, someone wanted to make the dandelion gruit. That's a great beer. That's um, one of my favorites. Uh, so gruits are really cool. It's um, a beer without hops and Beer existed before hops, or I mean, types of beer existed, and yeah. so a king of... named Charles said, "We gotta use hops now." Um, but before <laughs> that, what you're making here would look a lot more like a natural root beer. So you'd have like burdock root, sassafras, sarsaparilla, all these like all these things that were gathered and thrown into beer, uh, and they eventually tasted something like beer. There's a couple examples. I'd say popular examples, but that's you know that's like. Yeah. And that, that's probably not the not reason accurate. the reason that hops got so popular for beer, other than the fact that they're they taste they make beer taste delicious, is because they're they act as a natural preservative. So when people were making beer and adding hops and they just lasted longer, so they kept doing it. Um, but we made a dandelion fruit where we used dandelion greens for that bitterness and then added lemon peels and peppercorns and it's it's super light and flavorful and delicious and one of my all-time favorite beers that we've ever made. Yeah, and you could probably actually make it if um, we could send you the instructions and you could probably make it with either the base of the New England IPA um, because it is pretty high in wheat, which the Gruet was. Um, or something or, like the Berliner Weiss would be. Yeah, the Berliner Weiss would actually be the best thing if you wanted to make that at home. Um, and then plus you can make it sour. If you yeah, if you wanted to make a sour grit, I think I might be making that I, next. Yeah, I think, <laughs> that yeah, sounds delicious. Yeah, I think while we have this all set up, we might just go ahead and do that. Um, let's see. Do we have a Brute IPA? Stay tuned. Yes. What can I say? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, after at the boil for 60 minutes, you want to cool this down. We did that just in a ice bath in the kitchen sink. Takes about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, it's not... It's not a super long time to cool down just a gallon of beer, um, but you want to make sure that you have ice or ice packs ready before your brew day. And to save time today, we have one already cooled because we've definitely done demos where we've had to pour hot water into here and then add yeast and shake, and you see Steven really cringing because it's any, burning. If any glasses <laughs> to individuals understand, pouring hot liquid is just not fun, especially <laughs> when you can be pouring it on your feet. Um, and at this point, um, well, it, we talked about sanitizer in the beginning. This is when it becomes extra important because... You know, things over 170 degrees are generally considered sanitar sanitary. Um, that's hot. Most things don't survive. Um, but remember, you've just cooled down your beer. So, you know, we've rinsed the jug. We've been soaking the airlock. We have our spray bottle. Erica just took stuff out of the bowl of sanitizer. You're going to spray liberally. 
sanitizer. It's no rinse sanitizer, so you don't have to be super concerned. I wouldn't pour it in your beer, but... If, if a couple drops get in, totally fine. And we tell you to sanitize the whole time because, you know, three, three hours in, you're taking breaks, you're eating snacks. It's a good habit so that all of a sudden you're not scrambling to, to start dunking things. It's already here. You've been doing it the whole time. And um, Nicholas asks that with it being winter, can you just put your beer outside? Short answer, yes. Mm -hmm. um, just put a pot cover, uh, put a lid on your pot. Remember the whole thing about sanitary uh, conditions. Um, so keep it clean. Remember to sanitize the top of the lid. Um, put it out in the snow. That honestly works pretty darn great. If you have a larger basin, you can fill that with like cold water and just leave it there. When you start your brew day, it's going to be pretty cold by the end of it. And then just kind of float your, don't exactly float your beer in there, but yeah, you can definitely cool it outside. Use whatever means necessary. All right, you want to pour this in? Uh, so we have a pretty large strainer uh, and it has a really cool mesh uh, guard in it. The New England IPA is pretty much just hops, so it will catch any hop sediment in it. Um, but if you're brewing some wacky beers like that dandelion fruit where you have all the dandelion leaves, it's really helpful to have something to catch it. Otherwise, um, you can sanitize your strainer again and put that over your funnel. But you want to, the only thing you want going into the fermenter is the liquid and none of the spices that you've added along the way. Yeah, you're taller. Cool, I'm the tall one. So, I'm just gonna pour this in here. And um, another reason why we like having the strainer is that it just aerates your beer a bit more. So, yeast um, likes having kind of aerated beer at this point. So, anything you can do. Uh, to just introduce more air at this point is a good thing. Uh, later on in the process, you want to minimize that. Oops, I filled it a little high. I got excited. But it's actually, it's perfect. So the, uh, if you notice a one gallon mark there, that's what you want to fill it to. I'll get a tight shot of that too. Yeah. Even if uh, you have some extra liquid that goes like all the way up here, you don't want to fill it that high um, because the yeast needs room to bubble. <laughs> We're switching to that close shot. So, as you can see, let me know if you can have trouble seeing it, but there's a one gallon mark right there. That's what you want to fill your beer to. Cool. And now we're going to add the yeast. Add the yeast. So why we stress sanitization all the way is um, because now this delicious wort is full of sugar and all the wild yeast and bacteria in the air kind of want want to get at it. And so keeping things clean along the way ensures that your ale yeast is the one that will win. Um, wild yeast is great if you're making a wild beer, but if you're making a not wild beer, <laughs> you definitely want your ale yeast to win. So I'm going to add this in. And sorry, we did get a request to see the dog. Oh, hi. <laughs> that is Porter. <laughs> she is a beer dog. So. Yes. <laughs> That was, that was who you heard. <laughs> Only once, I should say. <laughs> okay, you wanna close up on cool. yeast? So, we have the yeast here, yeah. and it goes into, oh, hold on, sorry. Okay, there so we we're go. gonna pour more in there. Yay. So just get the whole packet in there. It's going to just float right there at the top. You can get a Cool, cool bottle, bottle view. So that's what you're going to be seeing. Um, and there's there's kind of debate whether you should shake it or at least shake it. So <laughs> we're now just going to again sanitize. And you can our hands. you can do the screw cap stopper so that it's less an area to cover, or you can just yeah, yeah, we can do put, it with. We can put it back on there. All right. 
Cool. Screw cap stopper on, hand is sanitized. You're going to just lift it up and shake it. And you're just waking up the yeast and introducing them to this party that is going to be their meal for the next two weeks. Exactly. So when we talked about getting air in there, that's just what we are doing. If you are a brewery, you would basically toss a big, like, you would get a can of air or like a, you know, big tank and put an air stone, kind of like if you had an aquarium. Uh, but we don't, we don't have an aquarium. We actually do have an air stone, but this is a lot easier. Every so often, just take your hand off because the shaking is basically creating a little vacuum in there, and that's how you know that the air is being absorbed into the liquid. So just shake it all up a bunch. We're going to stop shaking there, but if I were doing this on another day, I'd probably shake for another minute or two, but it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> that's just because I just love shaking it. So for the first few days of fermentation, you're going to use a blow-off tube. I know I said earlier that you didn't need this tubing today. You do. So I quickly dunked it in. You also use it in bottling day. And you can actually use the same bowl that you had your sanitizer in to leave one end of your tubing and put the other into your fermenter. You don't want to push this into the liquid. If you do, you'll accidentally siphon your beer out. So about an inch of the way in, just so it's not going to fall out if your cat runs by, um, but it's not going to fall into the beer and accidentally siphon that the wrong way. Exactly. And one thing you can do, you can do a bowl, but one, one thing that works pretty well is a beer bottle mm -hmm. that you then put in a six pack. It's not going anywhere. The tube can't come out because the opening is so narrow, plus no dust or anything else is going to fall into it. Um, so that's one like easy trick that you can do. A jar also works pretty nicely because it's pretty stationary, um, and you can like you know keep keep other stuff from getting in pretty easily. And with any of those options, you can use the same sanitizer that's in your bowl and just pour it in. You don't have to make fresh sanitizer every time it touches something. It's sanitizer. It's clean. So as long as you weren't dumping grain into this, um, you're good to use it. For the blow off too. And we had a question about just the amount of yeast. Um, these are roughly three grams or so of yeast. Um, this is for a one gallon batch. A uh, larger five gallon batch, you might be using like an 11 gram packet, 11 and a half gram packet um, is kind of the standard size um, that you might see. So the reason for a blow off tube is because the most activity happens uh, not immediately. So when you put this in, don't like sit here staying and wait for the yeast to start bubbling. It's gonna happen like six to 12 hours after you finish. So the next morning, check your beer, it's going to be bubbling away. And to get rid of all that CO2, you have the blow off tube. After two to three days, it's going to calm down a lot. That's perfectly normal, nothing bad has happened to your beer. There'll still be a lot of activity. It's just not enough to like throw the airlock into the air. So you can switch to the airlock. Airlock, you wanna sanitize, so definitely uh, you can use the sanitizer that you've had for the blow-off tube, or if you set some aside, or if you keep some in a spray bottle like we do all the time, you have it handy. But this is your airlock. You want to fill it two-thirds of the way with sanitizer, then put your little dome on, and the cap. Shake it so that any sanitizer that did sneak down into there doesn't get into your beer, but once again, a couple drops, totally fine. And then you're going to put that here. So now you have your airlock in your screw cap stopper. This is still tucked away in a cool, dark place. You don't, hops are broken down by sunlight, so you don't want to store it on your kitchen table, by the window. You want to tuck it away um, during fermentation. But otherwise, this is great to go for the full two weeks, and it will the first few days after switching to the blow-off tube, you'll see bubbles in here, and those will start to stop too, but don't bottle early. Uh, we always get this question, if somebody's traveling, whether it's better to bottle early or to bottle late, always bottle late. Bottling early, there can be too many, too, you have, it hasn't finished fermenting yet, so you don't want to bottle it. There'll be too many fermentable sugars. You can lead to overcarbonation. Uh, an extra week, an extra two weeks in the fermenter doesn't hurt at all. So definitely 
opt for bottling late over early. And especially in the winter or if you live in a cold house, uh, fermentation will just take longer uh, at colder temperatures. So yeah. when in doubt, just, just wait a few days, wait a few weeks. You want to be um, looking for any sign of like bubbles happening at the top there. If bubbles are still occurring either on the surface of your beer or in the airlock, just wait. Um, so we had some questions uh, about just confirming the temperature. So mid 60s, mid 70s are ideal. Um, yeah, ale yeast pretty much like the temperature you like to live in. So as long as it's comfortable for you, it'll be comfortable for them. If it's a cold garage, they'll go to sleep. Don't do that. Um, lager yeast uh, takes a lot longer and likes colder temperatures. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to do at home. So we all our kits are with ale yeast, um, which, yeah, mid-60s to mid-70s is great for. And while adding your yeast to beer that's still too hot will kill your yeast, adding your yeast to beer that's too cold is just keeping it asleep, basically. So warming it back up, it'll wake up and you'll be, you'll be fine. So yeah. nothing to worry about. So if you realize that, like, oh, geez, I put it in the basement again, it got cold, it's fine, just move it to somewhere not as cold and it'll just be fine after a couple yeah, days. Yeah, it will it will wake back up. Um, but yes, definitely check the surface area, make sure there's no bubbling before you bottle. Uh, during fermentation, this is going to look murky. Uh, New England IPA is never going to get super, super clear, but it's going to get a lot less murky. And that suspended yeast uh, and hot matter will start to settle down. So one week in, you might have sediment like hanging out about halfway. Uh, it's going to look a little crazy, not, not <laughs> appetizing, but totally normal. That sediment will continue to fall and compact until it's ready to be bottled. And so at the end of fermentation, you should have kind of like a, a three quarters of an inch to an inch of sediment that's pretty compact at the bottom. If it's still like a quarter of the way up, give it an extra few days, give it an extra week until it's it's settled out. And we have a question about double dry hopping, which oh, yeah. of course we have to do, because this is a New England IPA. Yeah, this so is if you've a ever, New England IPA. So, so <laughs> when we switched the airlock, we actually should have added some hops. Yeah. So, uh, so these, these hops went in at the very end of the boil. We're done with them. But these hops are supposed to go in three days. So when we switch to the airlock, we're already opening it up. That's a great time to add some hops. Here you well, go. So hops luckily are antiseptic, so you don't have to sanitize your hops because hops do that job for themselves. So. Yeah, and a fun fact, the only other real commercial use for hops is in all natural deodorants. So if you look in the back of like Tom's, Tom's main deodorant, you'll see hops, um, but otherwise, and it's for those antiseptic uh, properties. So we've added some hops straight to the top. You don't want to shake it at this time um, because remember, while adding oxygen at the beginning was great, adding it now is not good. Your beer will get oxidized. So you just let it sit there and yeah. that's it. So you do that after three days of fermentation. Uh, then you're going to do it one more time a week from this. So basically like just a couple days before bottling. So. So basically you have your beer, you, you have your brew day, you start fermenting. Three days later, you switch it from a blow-off tube to an airlock. You add your first round of double dry hop beer uh, hops. You add your hops. <laughs> and then uh, a week after that, you add more hops. So basically the, uh, we did like two-fifths of the hops. Then we did another fifth of the hops at the end of the boil. We do another fifth of the hops let's call it 20% of the hops after three days and the last remaining 20% a week later. Yeah. And it's um, equal parts cascade and mosaic the whole time. So you're adding both of those hops in equal amounts of uh, five, uh, oh, four different times. And this beer is going to be cloudy um, because those hops, while they will be settling down, they'll just be hanging out in your beer a lot more than, than normal. So. Yeah. And that's basically how you make beer. So right mm -hmm. now, remember you wanna keep it out of direct sunlight. So we have a lot of light here, but as soon as we're done, we're going to put it kind of around the corner, either in the closet or you can cut it, put it under the sink, just somewhere out of the way because all these hops are broken down by UV light. And if you don't have a place 
that you can close out or it's a cabinet that gets opened all day long and you're worried, you can always put it in like a dark bag and tie it up and it will be perfectly safe that way too. Yeah. And yeah, and that's basically how you make beer. So we're just going to answer a few more questions. Um, we Thanks have, so much for tuning yeah, thank in. Thank you so much. Yeah. Again, I'm Steven. This is Erica. Uh, we're from Brooklyn Brew Shop and yeah, we're so glad that you Kind of chose chose this uh, time to take with us to learn how to make beer. This yeah. is something we love doing, and um, we hope you do too. Um, so, with that said, we have a question about less hoppy beers. Um, someone's making the chocolate maple porter, which is one of our favorite beers. Um, they want to know what the hops amount to there. I think if you want to know the measurements, like 0.4 ounces of Fuggle hops. Um, but more uh, from, from another perspective, even with beers that are not hoppy at all it's important to add some hops because as you're tasting the grain, you'll be tasting that sweetness. And beer without hops is really sweet and kind of unbalanced and, and weird. So adding some hops um, is going to give your beer balance, um, even if it's not hoppy at all. And actually, New England IPAs are strange in the sense that they're not bitter, um, which... Yeah. For all a, of that, those hops, the way you put them in, you're making sure that you're not getting the bitterness, but are getting all the flavor and aroma and like fun berry and citrus and pine, um, but not that like bitterness that you might not like if you don't like hoppy beers. Yeah. And then questions about um, bottling. We'll be doing that in the next video. So we're going to be, this is the first. So yeah, we, thank do, you. we do want to thank you for kind of being our very wonderful test subjects. Yeah, um, so first, this... first ever uh, live while we're answering questions, but um, we, if you signed up uh, through the site, we're going to be sending out this video after, and we'll also be inviting you to another class where we do bottling and kegging. Yeah, and we're going to be keeping it up uh, pretty consistently, so if you have any questions, send them our way at info at .com, or head to any of our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook. Subscribe here, because we've actually kind of taken a little time off of YouTube. We apologize, yeah, um, but we're but going to be doing videos a lot more consistently with um, just information about our the beers that we make, um, beers that you might be drinking. Um, just We want to get inspiration from you just like you're getting inspiration from us. Yeah, so if there's a video you want to see, definitely let us know, and we'll try and get into the lineup. Yeah, and then um, we have just a question about, um, so if, since we're not doing bottling, uh, questions about types of sugar. Um, it does depend on the recipe that you're making. For some darker beers, we do maple syrup. For lighter beers, we do either honey or you can use um, a smaller amount of table sugar. Yeah, if you are if you want to use table sugar instead of honey or maple syrup, shoot us an email. It is a smaller amount because that sugar is more fermentable. We'll add more carbonation, so we just want to give you the right amount of it. Um, if you're a vegan, don't have honey, agave is an even substitute, so you can substitute three tablespoons of agave instead of honey, and it will be treated the exact same way. Then we had a question of someone who filled it a little bit past the gallon mark. Should they pour it out? If it's in there, it's fine. Don't worry. Um, as long as you're not like up to the neck, you're okay. You want to leave basically some surface area, and you also don't want it to be so close to the top that it's just going to ferment and shoot out. Yeah. But as long as you're just a little bit above, that is fine. Um, hello from the Netherlands. Hello, oh, Netherlands. Hi. Um, uh, we have a question about gravities. Um, someone wants to know the original gravity and final gravity. I don't have that for this one offhand in the top of my mind. Um, but if you want to know, um, just send us an email at info at brooklynbrewshop.com. We will send you the gravities. If for any of our beers. For any, for any beer, if you have any questions ever, just let us know, and we'll happily send that over to you. We don't really talk in gravities because... Um, it's, we don't want to scare people. <laughs> we don't want to scare people, and it um, it's a lot of numbers. If anyone's not sure what we're talking about, gravity is essentially a way of measuring the density of your beer, and alcohol is less dense than water. So as water and sugar become alcohol, the density of your beer changes. So it's a good way to gauge when your beer is like basically done, and it's also a way to measure the alcohol level of your beer. Yeah. Um, we do have hydrometers on brooklynbrewshop.com if you want to start taking the gravity, and it's something that with our sparkling wine kits, it's the only, it's how you know it's done, so um, we definitely recommend it with that, uh, and higher ABV beers, um, but for just regular beers, you can, you don't need it, but if you want to get into, into all the stats of your beer, it's a fun thing to learn.
Yeah. Um, someone wants a video on making cookies from spent grain. Ah, um, cool. Yeah. We can, yeah, we can figure something out. In the meantime, remember, go to our website at brooklynbrewshop.com. Hit up top articles and then go to spent grain chef. Uh, I will not lie by saying we actually have the best collection of recipes, mostly done by Erica, of um, <laughs> recipes using spent grain, something we've been doing for a, like a decade now. Um, like really adventurous, great recipes, um, turning something that you normally throw out or if you were a bigger brewery, feed literally to chickens and pigs and turn them into like really complex, good um, desserts, doughs, you know, yeah. just lots of good stuff, uh, so check that yeah. out. Yeah, spent grain banana bread, uh, spent grain granola, and the spent grain pizza dough are, are my three top recommendations for, like, your first brew day, um, because they're easy, they're delicious, and not super complicated, and you already did something a little bit complicated on brew day, so, uh, but I love all the recipes up there. And we got a couple questions about how to raise the alcohol of your beer, <laughs> um, and how do you do it, just what is the connection between starting a beer and then, like, beers that have different degrees of alcohol. Yeah. And the number one rule of fermentation is sugar becomes alcohol. So you have to increase your sugar one way or the other. Um, typically, that'll be by brewing with more grain. So if you're brewing a beer that's like 5% alcohol, it'll have less grain typically than a beer that's 7% alcohol. And it's mostly base malt. You're gonna be increasing that base malt, which we talked about in the beginning. Um, because that's going to turn into sugars that'll turn into alcohol. Another way, which we didn't really talk about here because this beer doesn't use it, but you can add sugar during the boil. Um, and that you add at the very end after you shut the heat off because you don't you want to leave all that sugar as fermentable as it is. Um, but things like the chocolate maple porter, you add maple syrup in, grapefruit honey ale, you add honey, uh, Belgian style beers, you use candy sugar. So we have a great bourbon double recipe up on uh, on the website that is one of my all-time favorites and it comes with uh, Belgian candy sugar which looks like rock candy it tastes like rock candy it's delicious and what it does is up the alcohol of your beer without adding any body so it's um, why Belgian triples are so dangerous because they drink pretty light but are actually like 9 to 11 percent in alcohol um, which is definitely going to get you tipsy and if anyone's curious um, this is the beer making mixes page on the site we have I don't know, do we have like a 14 or so? We have oh, a lot more. of, we have, we have maybe 20 mixes right now, including the one at the top, which is really, really silly, called the Unicorn IPA. Um, if you ever want to make that, it's it's a... Uh, it's pink. It's a pink beer. It's really funny. We actually, we did a lot of testing to figure out what sprinkles actually float the best. Um, so it's, a, it's also a double dry hopped um, IPA that you add a little beat to it. So it's like a... Both a beer that started as a joke, but something that is actually quite complex and, and delicious. delicious. And we include sprinkles. So that might add a little bit of yeah. alcohol. And if there <laughs> if there is a recipe that you're wishing we brought back, if um, there is something that you want us to brew next, definitely let us know. We're always experimenting with new ones and changing up the mixes seasonally um, and would love to hear from you. So yeah. yeah. With that said... Keep in touch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, head to brooklynbrewchef.com. Head to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And remember to tag uh, Make Some Beer. Um, yeah, if you hashtag Make Some Beer on Instagram, we love sharing it in the stories, sharing it with our posts. Um, we really, we can't be in the kitchen with you, but we love seeing your beers, hearing your questions. And I should notice that I was pointing to all those things Sorry that you didn't see it, but oh. if you wonder why I was just doing mining, that was it, the keep in touch, and then the social media, and then the make some beer. Thank you again <laughs> yeah. uh, for, um, uh, for bearing with us today. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll definitely be hosting more classes and sending out a recap with the video of this one. Uh, but have a great Sunday. Bye. Have a great Sunday. Bye-bye. <laughs>